uh, your well, well, hello, boys and girls. It's when I feel like it o'clock. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom, which I might as well just start calling our NHL Pearls of Wisdom because it's happening so often right now that I have amazing people on, such as these people right here. John from Off the Wall Hockey, one of the finest in the land, great hockey mind, comes does some uh, awesome does some awesome videos. I've been following him for a long time. Reached out to him one time, and we've been doing this back and forth quite a bit, haven't we, John? Oh it's yeah, fun. it's awesome to be on again. Love uh, love doing stuff like this with everybody. It's so much fun. Yeah, and then we have Steel from Steel Flyers, www.steelflyers.com, a building website that is already a great website as it is. He does a uh, show with uh, Ronis, uh, an all sports show if you like F1, football, um, hockey, all of that stuff like that. Great podcast. I really highly recommend you check it out. This is the first time that the three of us have got together for something here, which, by the way, we're going to be doing a continuing series on the uh, um, each NHL team that we've been doing. Of course, everybody knows that, right? Everybody in the land has seen this. So, but, uh, and what they did in free agency and where they're going in the future and stuff like that. And we're going to be doing it with Colorado. Thank you, Steele, for coming on and doing this with us, my friend. Thank you very much for having me, man. What, a, what an honor and a blessing it is to be on with the great Perlo Wisdom. He dropping pearls all over the place. He, he sent his Perlo copter down to come fetch me to go bring him, bring him to the uh, Seattle apartment. Yes. So we're, we're all good, man. We're all good. We're all snuggled in here. And, John, it's, it's a pleasure, man. I can't, I can't wait to get into this with you. I've, I've also, too, been an admirer of your uh, past work and really uh, enjoy the things that you're doing right now. So I was looking forward to uh, coming on here and meeting you, man. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, it's awesome to meet you as well. This is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> right. I think so. I think we're going to have lots of frolic. <laughs> and by the way, Hernandez said thanks for the cookies. They were one. They were really good. Yeah, man. <laughs> the the, 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 the perlocopter driver. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, and if you guys do the subscribe thing and hit the button, which I don't know who hasn't yet. I think everybody in the land has. But if you've been maybe had the corona or something, weren't able to, we'll send you a My NHL Pearls of Wisdom necklace right to your door with that said helicopter. So do that. All right, let's get into it. Most one of the most interesting teams in the league, I would have to say. Uh, we we've discussed uh, this team quite a bit. It's pretty fascinating to watch Mr. Joe Sackett build this how he's built this team. I remember when Mr. Sackett first came in, people kind of chuckled that you know, oh, we're hiring another ex player guy type thing, uh, and uh, he kind of didn't really get a. a a rousing ovation for the move, and uh, well, he seems to have proved everybody wrong. All that intelligence that he showed on the ice seems to translate pretty well into the general manager chair. Uh, so let's look into it, and we'll start with uh, John. What do you what do you what do you think he about what Joe Sakic has done so far, and where Colorado is heading right now, my friend? Uh, the av he's done a masterful job. The Avalanche are absolutely one of the best teams in the NHL. Um, and I'll come out and say this right now. It's a little early to be trying to say where teams are going to finish next year. But if I had to bet money right now on where the Colorado Avalanche are going to finish next year, they are winning the Western Conference and they might win the league. They might be your presence trophy winning team next season. Um, this team is absolutely loaded. They're loaded up front. They're loaded on defense. The only question mark here, and we've talked about this a lot, is the goaltending. Does the duo of Philip Grubauer and Pavel Francouz hold up over a full season and into the playoffs? They had a pretty good year last year. Obviously, Grubauer got hurt in the second round against Dallas, and that was a big problem. Um, but... Uh, just masterful job of building this team and continuing this offseason to make incredibly good moves. Um, you know, re-signing guys like Andre Burakovsky and Valerie Nashushkin that needed to be re-signed. Bringing in Devon Taves from the New York Islanders for only two second-round draft picks. 
and a guy who's going to round out that defense now and probably going to play a box role on that team. He's a top four defenseman on probably 90% of the teams in the league. So they're just continuing to get better. They've got another year of experience under their belt, more playoff games under their belt. It's there. There's so much great things to say about Colorado. <laughs> like you could probably just keep going on, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. This, this team know? is one of my absolute favorites in the NHL as far oh, as how right, they've yeah. put this team together. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I think Sackick has done a great job uh, as well uh, coming in here and turning Colorado around. I mean, the fact that they lost to Dallas uh, in the playoffs this year says a lot. The fact that they were in the top four seed uh, at the beginning of the round robin also said a lot about them this year as well, too. Uh, I actually I had a toss up between Colorado and Dallas uh, to pick uh, for the West. And, and I had a toss-up between Colorado and Dallas. And I, I picked Colorado, but I thought Dallas would be the sleeper team. And so I won either way because, <laughs> either you know, Colorado lost, but my sleeper team got to the finals. So, okay, I'll take that. But I do really like what they did as far as bringing in Brandon Saad, too, from the Blackhawks. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? I think that was a re- another really good move to help solidify this team as well moving forward. You know what I mean? Um, We're looking at maybe, I guess they're projected at, uh, you know, now that they've signed some of those players that you had mentioned. They're, you know, and then they also um, uh, re signed uh, uh, Tyson Yost. Uh, So he, he, he he accepted his qualifying offer as well, too. So that also eats away at some of the cap. So I, I think they're just what one point eight or something like that. Under, yeah, they've got the one point eight mil in space right now. Right, and they have everybody ready to go this year, with the exception of one player. But what I'm concerned about, and I do agree with you, I I would pick Colorado for sure to go very, very, very deep into the West, very deep into the West. What I would be concerned about is next year. That's where my concern would be for Colorado. As they have their window is now they need to take care of things. Now they've got most of all their guys back. They've they've done nothing but improve this team since since the end of the playoffs. They've done nothing but improve this team. They drafted really well. You know what I mean? I, I, how could you not put them at the top of the West? How could you not? Yeah. Um, by next year, you mean possibly like re-signing players and stuff like that? Yeah, because they're going to have after after this coming season, they're going to have a, um, quite a few players that are either going to be um, unrestricted free agents, or they're going to have a couple that are going to be restricted free agents. Yeah, like and Gabriel so, Landeskog is going to be an interesting one. How much? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so it's going to be interesting how they're going to do that. And Grubauer is also up after this year too. So it's going to be interesting how they're going to how they're going to how Joe Sakic is going to be able to. Continue to build a team because we're carrying the cap into next year. It's going to be the same as it is this year. And if you're going into next year and you only have $1.8 million, that's not boding well for you next year either. You know what I mean? Especially when you have a laundry list of guys that you might have to come up that's going to need to be signed. Yeah. um, Well, the good thing about it with uh, Colorado, I think, and I resonate with John here with how well that Sackick has put this team together. Uh, probably for the future as well, um, is that they have managed to also build a pretty good prospect pool to, as well. If Brandon, if Brandon Saad doesn't have to be re-signed next year, um, I right. thought you, I thought you it was a really good point, by the way, Brandon Saad coming in, but for, especially for the trade that uh, they did do for Zadaroff, mm-hmm. because if there was one thing kind of missing from Colorado – is that they didn't have many cups in the room. And now Brandon Saad brings those cups that he got from Chicago and that playoff experience and stuff mm-hmm. into that room, and that's fantastic. But they've got guys like Kout, uh coming up that might be able to fill his role if they decide not to re-sign him. Um, so on defense, they have kind of Timmons and Bowen Byram. Uh, Timmons is a guy that they've been bringing on around quite a, like for quite a while, and it looks like he's ready. And Bolo Byram is like one of their a uh, great prospect that uh, they can use to fill in some holes on the defense 
if there are players that they can't sign. Though, so I do agree with you, and I will be interested to see what kind of uh, contract whispering, which is mm-hmm. another thing I'd like to get into, and I'll pass it over to John. Uh, this, the, the contracts that Joe Sackick has got these guys on are absolutely ridiculous. Now, Landeskog is coming up right now. He's already a ridiculously low five point something million dollars per year for what he does as a top line left winger. What kind of contract is he going to sign with Sackick? I mean, he could easily demand seven or eight million dollars, but I, I, I wonder what uh, will actually happen there and what Joe Sackick will get him to sign on the dotted line for. But uh, one of the big things we has been impressive with this team, John, is that he has seemed to prepare for the future and for now. Uh, and uh, that and the and the salaries that he signed, right? Uh, Joe Sacker has got them to sign. Yeah, it's been it's been unreal. I'll pull up my best friend cap friendly up now. This uh, it's I mean Nathan McKinnon should be making <laughs> probably eleven to twelve million dollars per year, and he's um six point three for the next three seasons. <laughs> <laughs> that is just absurd. Yeah. And Landis God, like you said, he's only at five five. Yep. Right. Landis and you, you, he should be seven or eight mil a year, right? Yep. Yeah. S- Sam, <laughs> Sam Gerard at five million for as far as cap friendly goes, like the next like seven years, six years, <laughs> five million a year for Sam Gerard, who's yeah. only twenty two years old. I mean it's unbelievable what he's been able to pull off with some of these contracts. Uh, Andre Burakovsky at under five million a year at four point nine. You know, um, Eric Johnson, six and, million for three. Yeah, De, I mean Devon Taves just signed for four point one. He could yep. easily have gotten five from someone else. He signed Easy. for like a million less than what he would have anywhere, like somewhere else. It's it's unbelievable. Ryan Graves had such a great season last year, and they get him at three point one six million. Wow! It's like every contract that they sign is team friendly, and it, yeah. I you just you don't see this very often. It's kind of the opposite of what Toronto's done and what they've been forced into with their big contracts. It, these guys are signing at a fraction of what they're actually worth, and you know, they've got Kale McCarr coming up as an RFA after this coming season. They, they, I, I want to, I cannot wait to see what Sackett gets McCarr to sign for because I have a feeling it's going to be some ridiculously team friendly deal along the line of Nathan McKinnon's. And they're just like, yeah, yeah we just want to win Stanley Cups. Like, but see, that's the thing. I think you hit it right there on the head. And I think this goes to exactly the ownership the coach and the general manager because everybody wants to be here and play here because it's the culture here. It's the fact that this team takes care of its players. Okay. And you can see that it's taking care of its players. It's given them term and it's given them dollars. It's look, it's not giving them top dollars because they can't afford it. And, and the players are like, yeah, man, look how close we got. We lost to Dallas. Dallas lost to Tampa Bay who hoisted the cup. Okay. So I, I easily see them coming back this year doing exactly the same thing that they did last year and making a run for the cup again, I, especially I with the team yeah, they have. I don't know what he's saying. I don't know what he's saying. I know that when McKinnon signed his contract, I'll tell you what, if he was my son, I would have been like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sackett's, got, Sackett's got that magic. He just goes, you will sign this contract for this <laughs> amount of money. And the player goes, uh-huh. Okay, yeah. here you go. <laughs> I really don't can't. I really can't put my. I don't know. Like, it's like agents just go gaga when Joe talks or something. Like, I, I'm not sure. It's it's got to be it's got to be the kind the character of the players that they are bringing in, Maybe. and I think these guys are going there knowing that they're going to a contending team and a team that's going to be competing for Stanley Cups for the foreseeable future. And I think that these are guys that want to win. I know Nathan McKinnon is like that, and he's actually yeah. been very vocal about 
taking team friendly deals and saying like, I don't need to get paid $12 million a year. I want to win Stanley Cups. And Colorado is a place that I think I can win Stanley Cups. And I think Sackick is bringing in players with that mentality and that kind of that kind of attitude. They're not there to be the richest players in the league. They're there to be winning players in the league. <laughs> and if you get a whole team to buy into that, then that is going to be a very, very good team. And I think Tampa, to a degree, has gotten that as well. And we've yeah. seen that with guys like Stamkos taking money that when Stamkos signed that contract, he could have gotten a lot more on the oh open market. Are you kidding and he signs for eight and a half million to stay in Tampa. Victor Hedman t- took a very Tampa friendly deal. Nikita Kucherov has taken Tampa friendly money, and that's resulted in them being an absolute powerhouse in the league and you know winning a Stanley Cup this past year. I think we're seeing a very similar thing happening with the Colorado Avalanche. I, I man, you look. You have to put it into this bucket. Do you want to be the richest player in the league, or do you want to be the player that has the most rings? Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's all fine and great if you want to be the richest player. And I got no problem with somebody that wants to do that. And, and good on you if you can go do that. Go, go have your fun and whatever, whatever. But I think you hit it exactly on the head. These guys are looking to win cups. So they're and with the coach. Okay, uh, Chuck uh, Bednar, I think, has put the system in there that has highlighted these players, has brought the best out of these players, and has been able to get these guys to the point where they're able to be, we can say, yes, these guys are contenders for the next couple years. Yeah, I, that, those are really good points. Uh, um, there's another thing that I was just thought about while you were talking. You brought up something sick, because you brought up Tampa Bay, who – was built by Stevie Eisenman. Breeze Ball has done a hell of a job. Really should get a, a lot of credit too because he did fantastic as well. But it's, there's something here. These guys were both ex-players, right? Mm-hmm. If yeah. there's one thing I think that these guys know is most of your money that you're going to make is through two things as a player. Uh, investing for one. So they probably put them on this huge investment plan and say, look, we promise make like huge money regardless if you take the three million or whatever we have the best mm-hmm. investors in the business mm-hmm. but yeah. and there's another thing endorsement so what maybe these guys are both doing is they find people that know how to endorse their players and say look we can make you more money than our salary is even going to matter like the two three million isn't going to matter if you go to any other team no other team is going to endorse you like we are so they could be getting huge endorsement opportunities because these players had were endorsed. Sakic and Eisenman were endorsed at a time when players weren't being endorsed as much. NHL mm-hmm. wasn't as big as it was back then. But Eisenman and Sakic were always. So they probably have a lot of endorse, endorsement people that they know, that know how to ba- maximize the dollar that these guys can get from doing endorsements, which is mu- which is minuscule compared to their salaries. Just thought about that when you guys were speaking. <laughs> yeah, and another thing that I'm just thinking of right now, and I don't know if this is actually happening or not, but I wonder if there's an allure for a lot of these players to play for guys that they probably grew up watching True. and idolized. Oh, like, well, hey, yeah. We're, we're in the age, we're at the age point now where these players are around my age in their mid 20s, and they grew up watching Joe Sackick and they grew up watching Steve Eiserman in their primes. And there, there's got to be something when you walk into a room and you see Joe Sackick. This was the guy putting up 100-point seasons yeah. on on your television when you were eight years old in your, in yeah. your living room watching with your dad. This, you idolized this guy, and now you're in the room with him, and he wants you to play hockey for him. That, that's got to have a power to it. Like, Joe Sackick wants me to pay, play hockey on his team. Like, I would... I would take any contract, Mr. Sackick, whatever, whatever you want to give me. I would love to play on yeah. your Colorado Avalanche. Like, there's got to be a powerful effect there of that being Joe Sackick for these players, particularly in this particular age range now, who grew up watching him when he was in his prime. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I never even thought of it like that because there's been 
look, you have a lot of GMs that were once players. Mm-hmm. And in Philadelphia, we had one in Ron Hextall. And Ron Hextall was a legendary goalie in Philadelphia. Okay? And not so much as a GM. He was in L.A. He put together multiple cups in L.A., okay, as the assistant general manager out there and learned how to do it through the draft and everything like that. And then he came to Philadelphia and it was like, uh, same thing happened with Bob Clark. Same, You know what I mean? He was a great player, but not necessarily the best GM. So there are players that do make good GMs, and Iserman and Sackick are the few and far between guys that are the ones that make it. And I think there's other guys, unfortunately, that don't. You know, I think there's a, that's a really good point. There are a lot. Not all of them work out. Hence the reason why Joe Sackett got fired. Right. People were like, oh, great, another yeah. ex player or something like that. Now, the big difference, though, and not that Joe, I mean, not that Clark wasn't a great player, he was, but both Eisenman and Sackett, what they were known for was a ridiculously high hockey IQ. Yes. Ridiculously well, high. They were incredibly intelligent players. Not just everybody would say, even outside of hockey, these guys were brilliant. So mm -hmm. um, that is kind of the difference between the two. They can see things from another perspective. But there's something else I thought of, too. There was another part of Eisenman and Sackick that I think can get these great contracts and all that. They were always the classiest players in the league. Mm -hmm. yep. Steve Eisenman and Joe Sackett were the classiest players that yep. you would ever find. So people trust them because they played, they acted as people in the game that led them to a level of trust that allows them to do what they do. So the combination of all of it, I did not know we were going to spin into this great conversation. About yeah, yeah right. Talking, because... but, but I don't think you can talk about Colorado without talking about this you either, can. right? Because he's changed the culture there. Okay? Yeah. He mm -hmm. has. He's come in and he's changed the culture there with bringing in uh, Bednar as the coach. And then the players that he's been bringing in, he's changed the culture there. Okay? To the point where now, yeah, guys are coming in and looking at, oh, my gosh, that's Joe Sackett. I'm going to sign a contract and play on Joe Sackett's team. Okay, how much do you need me to sign for, Joe? No problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's kind of where it's at. And the same thing with Steve Eiserman. Steve Eiserman, because both of these guys are brilliant, they've proven that they can put together teams. They mm -hmm. have been both proven commodities, and that is few and far between when it comes to especially GMs and especially ex-player GMs. Yes. And that's why I think Sackick and Eiserman are the exception to the rule, and that's why guys are lining up to play for them, because exactly those reasons why we all just said. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, not that we're going to. We'll talk about this team pretty soon and we're gonna we might as well enter that up here too we're gonna to have to talk about them right away since we're going in perlo alphabetical order <laughs> <laughs> your, your alphabetic order the, the perlo alphabet order doesn't Which, exactly follow the real alphabet <laughs> oh it's alphabetical order ish everything yeah, ish. Yeah, everything is ish, ish in perlo land <laughs> exactly. but the la kings have a general manager there that just came in in Blake, that uh, Rob Blake. That is that right? Is that yes. Right? Yes, that's right. Rob Blake is, and he is another guy that was always known as a very brilliant uh, general manager. He's building a really strong team there, and I think that would be a good one. Maybe we can go to next. I haven't did the LA Kings yet. I hope you guys are enjoying this fine series and um, saw like we all the moves that that Joe made here. We talked about him a little bit. Uh, about some of the moves, but we can sit here and gloat about all the moves all we want. I think this is a great conversation about how, why Joe Sackick is able to do what he consistently is able to do in Colorado. I didn't really think it was going to spin into this like this, but I'm glad it did. It was fantastic. Hope you guys are enjoying this fine series that we're doing. Um, next time, I hope we usually switch back and forth. I'll go maybe on John's channel. John, you just did a great thing that I enjoy that you do all the time. You talked about uh, on in your you're talking about players that uh, uh, players you don't remember. What's that series called again? Uh, yes, every every Friday I do a video. It's called uh, the series is called NHL Remember Him, and it's just kind of those 
not the superstar players that everybody knows, but the more mid-tier NHL players who played and were good players, but don't initially come to everyone's mind right away. But then as soon as you hear the name, you go, hang on, I remember him. And all of a sudden, it all comes back. So uh, the the last one I did was John Madden, who had a very good career with the New Jersey Devils. Devils. And then uh, won a cup in 2010 with the Chicago Blackhawks as well. And uh, was a great defensive forward for for over a decade in the NHL. So it's it's players like that who aren't the superstar guys that everyone knows, but still had very strong NHL careers. Yeah, his son's going to be playing. Tyler is an uh, LA Kings prospect. LA, that we yeah, just talked about. That was, a, that was a nice move by the LA Kings that we we're yes. just talking about. That Originally, Tyler Madden. Originally drafted by Vancouver, and LA got him in the Tyler Toffoli deal. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you nice, go. Nice, nice move. Uh, okay. Steel Flyers from www.steelflyers.com. So we can talk about that for days. The, how awesome that that is and is going to be. Uh, tell us a little bit about your project you got going on there, my friend. Well, we got all kinds of great stuff coming up here. We got a NHL Perla Wisdom website page coming out here soon. Um, so be on the lookout for that here real soon. And uh, we've got all kinds of great new uh, shows coming out. We just did a new show with uh, Lance Green called The Hockey Writers, Inc. Uh, Lots of great hockey writers on that show. Some uh, potentially some uh, players, prospects, ex-players, getting into all kinds of uh, hockey writers and all kinds of fun stuff on that. So uh, but you can get all of Perlow's stuff and all kinds of great stuff on the one stop shop, www.steelflyers.com. Awesome. Well, this is our full 42. I know it's mine. Anyways, I need a nap. Have a great... (laughs) (laughs) Too too much excitement for this old guy for one day. It's a good Uh, thing we got young guys like John out there to keep my pep up. This has been wonderful. We'll be back to my Seattle apartment here. Maybe I'll have you all over. I'll send the furlocopter. Another time, we'll be doing the LA Kings and many other different types of frolic. Have a great day, everybody. Lots of love to ya.